Hello everyone, welcome to this edition of Water Drops. Today we're going to be talking about interconnected pond modeling with info drainage. So who is this workflow for? This short presentation will be for stormwater modelers on drainage design projects. It'll be for design engineers looking to connect multiple stormwater storage elements or really just for anyone looking to get a more accurate view of how interconnected stormwater control elements will interact with each other hydraulically once they're constructed out in the field. Interconnected ponds aren't anything really new or, or groundbreaking in the realm of the drainage design space, but it is important to understand hydraulically how these are connected. It's important to understand whether or not your current stormwater solutions are capable of modeling these effects. It's becoming increasingly more important as well as we start to see a shift towards including more green infrastructure elements on a site. These green infrastructure elements, obviously they're typically smaller. They don't have as much volume storage capabilities as say a giant detention pond at the downstream end of your site. And you typically need a lot more of them dispersed throughout any given site. And so as you have more and more of these elements and you're linking them up and you're seeing them in series, it's really important to be designing them and modeling them, uh, not in their own kind of siloed environment. So moving away from just having a calculation for each of those stormwater control elements and having a program that can show you how all of them are going to interact with each other, including those tailwater and backwater conditions. So the workflow I'll be going through today, first we'll add a pond to an existing treatment train in an info drainage project, of course. Uh, we're going to perform a quick storage calculation on that pond, and then we will perform a dynamic hydraulic analysis in info drainage and take a look at those results and look at those interconnected ponds. So this, is, so this is an example of a residential site development project. You can see we have some existing residences around the outside of this site, but we're just going to be adding some additional condos in here and of course need to do our stormwater report to handle the runoff of this new developed area. So currently we have a rain garden set up, we have a couple catchment areas set up in here, and we have this dry pond kind of at the outfall of this fall of this system down here. This model has already been run, so if I go in and look at the inflows, I want to go over something really quick before we move on. Just take a look at these hydrographs and the runoff that's being calculated so you can see that for these catchment areas, uh, the storm's peaking at around 600 minutes into this simulation. And then again, if we kind of like look at those stormwater control structures, uh, we can see that in the rain garden, we're also peaking, the flow in is peaking around that same time, which makes sense based on the criteria that we established. So what if we were to need to handle some offsite drainage as well? Something has changed, another drainage study has been done. Not only do we have to handle the drainage from these two new proposed catchment areas, but we are going to have some offsite uh, drainage coming in and we need to detain that as well. So let's toggle over to a different phase where I already have that set up here. I have this pond added in this kind of space between these different condominiums. I have this off-site flow hydrograph that's connected into that pond. And then I have a connection between this upstream pond and that rain garden. So let's look at this offsite flow hydrograph. The important thing that I just want to point out here is that this hydrograph isn't even starting flow until minute 770. So flow is not even going to start to kind of enter this area until that time. If you can re recall from the inflow hydrograph that we looked at, that was based on the runoff of this catchment area here, that was peaking at about minute 660. So in this situation, we're considering that this offsite flow is taking a little longer to get to the system, but it's obviously still going to interact with these downstream elements at some point. 
so the, yeah, this is peaking at about minute 1000, but just wanted to point that out because it'll be important when we run this analysis and actually look at those results. And so let's also go ahead and take a look into this pond element. We have kind of an unrealistic pond here. Obviously don't want that to be triangular. So we'll just use this sizing calculator to quickly enter in some slide slopes, get a little more realistic representation of a pond. And that's really it. That's how you set up these interconnected ponds in info drainage. Note that we didn't have to manually go in and enter any tailwater conditions that we calculated in a different software package, a different software package. We just built our system as we want it to work, connected our flow areas, and the analysis will tell us how these are going to interact with each other. Invo Drainage uses a dynamic solver. It uses that EPA Swim 5 engine in the background that is obviously physics-based so that you're not having to make any assumptions in how these are interacting with each other. You're not having to be over conservative with how these are interacting with each other. And this is obviously important in any sort of system where you have any sort of interconnected stormwater control element. But again, it's even more important when you have a bunch of different smaller green infrastructure elements linked up and need to see how those impact each other as uh, a different storm duration progresses. So once that analysis has concluded, we are shown our stormwater control summary. But let's look at a profile view of our results here. So I'm going to preemptively shift to the 100 year event. That'll hopefully be a little more interesting. And then I will show this profile view and play through the simulation. So as you hopefully remember, that inflow hydrograph that was going into this rain garden was peaking at about uh, minute 600 in our simulation. So let's go to about that time. I'm going to just move this bar along here and let's get to, we'll go ahead and start it right around minute five, 600 here. So as you can see, that inflow hydrograph is really filling up this rain garden, but we can also see that the backwater effects that that's having on our upstream pond. So this pipe has started to fill up all the way back up to that pond. We can see that at minute 605, we are showing volume in this pond. Now, if you remember that hydrograph, that offsite drainage hydrograph that we had going into here, there was zero flow in that hydrograph until minute 770. So any volume that we're seeing in this upstream pond is indeed caused by the backwater from the downstream elements. This enables us to take any sort of guesswork out of how these ponds are gonna interact with each other. We can size these elements appropriately, not over conservatively, not slapping on a really high factor of safety onto them, but we have this evidence-based, physics-backed documentation of how these ponds are gonna interact with each other based not only on the independent hydrographs going into these individual storm water elements, but on how the system acts as a whole. And so that concludes today's presentation. Hopefully you can see some benefit in how info drainage handles these ponds and how the hydraulic engine represents interconnected ponds so that you can fully understand the hydraulics of your system. You can avoid over designing of these ponds and you can see some of the benefits of how understanding the footprint of those ponds and performing your calculations in a single step can help streamline your workflows.